week on El Cara Ham Radio. We're going to cut down some more trees at one of our repeater sites, and then we're going to get busy with the HF Remote Station. We're excited about this project, and come along with us here in part one. Some things don't go as planned. This week on El Cara Ham Radio. Alrighty, so one of the first things we have to do is talk a little bit about this new project. This is going to be the Elcara HF Remote Station, something we've been talking about for a little while as a proposed club project. It's going to require some planning, and it's also going to have to bring together some skill sets that uh, multiple members will be needed to bring this to fruition. We're excited about that because it's not all just ham radio-based skills. In addition, we need to ask a few questions to see if this is even going to be a viable project. Once implemented, who can use this HF station? What steps are we going to need for this project? And will it require monetary funds? Will we need to have some out-of-pocket expenses? But most of all, can we have fun putting such a remote station on the air and ultimately have a brand new club asset? I believe the answer is yes. So is this project doable? And I believe the answer is yes for our club. It might not be yes for every club, though. There are multiple skill sets needed, and you'll have to identify whether or not you have members within the club with those skill sets. Not only are we talking about ham radio skill sets, but internet connectivity, security, as well as antenna uh, thoughts and so forth. So this is a multidisciplinary type of project, and it wouldn't be for every club. In addition, once it's fully implemented, who's going to use this remote HF station? Well, all license holders would at least have the opportunity to utilize this remote station. Yes, training's going to be involved, and we will have to have a few safeguards built in to make sure that it's not misused. But overall, yes, just about any license holder would be able to use this, and we'll have to come up with a scheduling system to ensure that uh, we don't have members stepping on each other when they go to use the remote HF station. In addition, what steps will this project need? Well, planning always comes first, and we're going to have to think about equipment and software, as well as those aforementioned skill sets. Once implemented, we'll have to think about internet security, the transceiver selection, and so on. Then scheduling users so that we can reduce conflicts of uh, try users trying to use the radio at the same time, as well as monitoring in case of misuse. Is there a way to kick somebody off the station if, for some reason, the need were to arise? We hope it doesn't, but you still have to have that uh, use case in your scenario. Will this require monetary funds? Well, probably. It depends on the club and the equipment that some members may want to donate, donate to such a project. Um, we will have to think about what transceiver do we want to use, what antenna do we want to use, and will those antennas be readily available? Do we have to create the antenna? And again, those aforementioned internet skills and connectivity. When you're hooking things up to the internet, security becomes paramount, and we'll want to make sure that we can make it happen. But we may have to raise some funds if some of those items aren't readily available. Lastly, we want to have fun with such a project. Not only have we talked to our members to see if it's something they would want to do, but we also talked to quite a few people at Hamcation down in Florida to see if it was really possible. The answers we got back from multiple people we talked to was an emphatic Yes. So have fun with projects like this. Not for every club, but if it is, think about how much fun it will be. So we started getting work done at one of our sites, which included felling some trees. Uh, we're going to be putting up some solar panels in this rough area, but we're also thinking that the antenna that we're going to use, possibly antennas, will need to fit in the same location. So these trees had to go. So as we'll see a little bit later, sometimes things don't go as planned. So Chris on his radio, this is an 891 from Yesu, was checking on the 40 meter band to see what was the noise floor. 
Can we pick up signals? Now, he's using an ATOS 100, I think it is, and he was just checking to see what type of signals was he getting and what was the noise floor. We're looking for whether or not there were environmental noises or interference being created that might preclude us from using this site. We didn't actually see anything of major importance, uh, specifically on the bands that will probably get used most often. Here he is dialing through the 40 meter band, and then I'm going to do the same thing. I brought out the ICOM 7300 just to look at the waterfall in addition to the, uh, the band itself, starting towards the bottom and working our way up. 40 meters was quite active the day we checked, and we also off camera uh, checked in with a couple of nets and people you, uh, calling out CQ. We had a really easy time checking in with some of those stations. This is on top of a hill or a small mountain, if you will. And so we believe our reach with a good antenna is gonna be really, really good. So looking through, through 40 meters, things looked really good from a noise floor perspective, as well as any extraneous noises created by equipment in the area. Thankfully, there isn't much up on this mountain, but we do share this real estate with a, a Kentucky Educational Television Tower, a thousand foot tower, but it didn't seem to be generating any noise that we could discern. Now we're going to move to Chris's radio again. He's going to move up to 14 megahertz, and so we're going to take a look at 20 meters to see what was the noise floor and whether or not we had any environmental concerns, as I talked about a little while ago, and we didn't really see any. So this was, again, one of the reasons why we are doing the site survey is to see if the particular site would be conducive to having a remote HF station. Thus far, on the two bands that we've checked, 40 and now 20 here on the 7300, things are really quiet. You can see the noise floor is really low in between those two uh, signals and uh, 20 meters was quite busy. All of that were people on 20 meters, not extraneous noises from equipment or transformers or anything like that. So we were pretty chuffed looking at uh, uh, 20 meters and 40 meters before that. So we're just kind of rolling down the band just to see if we could see any, again, extraneous signals, and uh, things look pretty clear. So again, we were pretty happy with 20 meters, at least on this particular day. Finishing up on 20 meters, I'm uh, pausing occasionally just to check the noise floor, and as you can see, it's quite low, so we were pretty happy on this day. Now, back over to Chris. He's checking uh, 17 meters here. We don't use 17 meters very often. It's a very narrow band, but we wanted to check it. Noise floor was quite good. And if we switch over to the 7300 where we have a waterfall, yet again, we see nice clean bands here, no extraneous noises. So again, pretty happy with 17 meters. Don't know how much we'll actually use that, but we thought, hey, we're doing a site survey. Let's at least throw it into the mix. Just about finished up here on 17 meters. We're going to switch back over to Chris. And here we go. Now, this is on 21 megahertz or 15 meters. We actually made a contact up on top of the mountain on 15 meters off camera uh, in Loveland, Colorado. Uh, Whiskey Delta One Whiskey was the call sign that we reached out to and made a nice contact. Noise floor, again, looking good. Chris is going through this quite fast, uh, but 15 meters was looking really good yet again. We were getting pretty excited about our site survey because it really looked like we were going to have a good opportunity on multiple bands. Just depends ultimately on the antenna we either build or purchase for the remote HF station. We're thinking multi-banded. It's one of the reasons why we're checking all of these different bands. We might utilize a dipole that's going to be resonant on multiple frequencies. And so uh, on this particular day, as an aside, we were utilizing a, uh, a Palomar engineer's uh, off-center fed dipole to run many of these tests just to make sure that we would have you know, decent sensitivity and uh, be able to see any extraneous noises. Things look good on 15 meters. And now we move to 12 meters. Again, something that uh, a band we probably won't use a lot of, very narrow, 
but we were checking it anyway uh, as a part of the site survey there on Chris's 891. Switching over to 7300, uh, looking at uh, some of this band as we progress through it uh, to see if we saw any extraneous noises. There were a couple of, of noises popping up here. And uh, again, not sure how much we'll actually use this band, but uh, at least on this particular day, not too bad, but there were some spurious signals there. We're now going to move over to a band that gets used pretty frequently, and that's 10 meters. On Chris's 891, again, the noise floor was essentially zero, very, very low. Uh, and that was one of the things we were worried about, at least a little bit, on this particular mountain with the KET tower just a stone's throw away, plus our own shack. Ultimately, this radio will be in the shack, but the antenna, of course, will be on the outside. So Chris is seeing that the band overall is usable on the 891 as he just goes through it. The 7300 shows it a little better with the, the waterfall to see if there's any extraneous signals or unwanted noise, but it looks really good. Uh, 10 meters, again, uh, a band that you can use. We actually have a 10 meter emergency net utilizing uh, 10 meters, and we hope to use this rig for that, um, that particular net in the future because it'll have a, a little bit better reach than some of our members-based radios. But overall, 10 meters look quite good and very quiet on this particular day. Of course, 10 meters spans 28.300 all the way up to 29.700 or 29.7 megahertz. So quite a wide band takes a little while to kind of scan through there. And again, with the waterfall, you can occasionally see a little uh, spike of noise coming through at pretty regular intervals. On this particular day, uh, there was a lot of gap between those uh, signals or those uh, uh, the, the interference or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so we felt like it was in a pretty good uh, situation, but we'll have to keep an eye on that in the future. 10 meters finishing up. Now we move to six meters. Of course, this is one of those other really wide bands. Six meters right now is not the greatest because of the sun cycle, but hopefully it will get better in the future. Uh, Chris is just blowing his way through here on the 891 on six meters, just kind of keeping an eye on the noise floor, but um, he's going so fast, I'm not sure if he can really tell. But nonetheless, as we went through six meters, we found that it was just as quiet as all of the other bands on this particular day. It's not as susceptible to lightning and things like that. Uh, for instance, such as 80 meters would be much more susceptible or even 160. But uh, uh, as he blows through here, you can see he's pausing to see what that noise floor is. You can see there's a little bit of, uh, uh, on his S meter there, some spiking. Um, but oh, when we get to the waterfall over on the 7300, you really can't see any of this. So again, that noise floor is just almost zero on his 891. So we were pretty happy with that. So a <laughs> pretty wide band here. Chris will be finishing up on six meters here in about 20 seconds. And as you can see, again, that S meter is not reading much noise at all. So the noise floor was definitely something we were very curious about, and it looked to be quite good, quite, quite low, which is uh, helpful when you're trying to get some of those weaker signals. So here I am starting at the bottom of the band, but again, keep an eye on the uh, waterfall. And we're looking for regular, at regular intervals, banding that usually indicates some type of interference or EMI, electro electrical magnetic interference, um, and uh, we're just not seeing any. Of course, I'm going through this fast, but the waterfall, if there was something there, uh, would show it to us, um, and uh, just not much there, if anything. So I was quite happy with it. Of course, I went through this a little bit faster. So I mentioned everything didn't quite go uh, uni unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> One of the trees we felled took out our power line. We didn't do our due diligence on making sure that that tree was going to land in the right spot. We thought we were cutting it correctly, but sadly, no. And here we do uh, a couple of shots to the left and to the right so that you can see the shack. And we have space for antennas both to the left and to the right. We're thinking to the right will ultimately be where we're going to put that antenna. So well, that will wrap it up for this site survey at one of our repeater sites. We still have one more repeater site to get to, and if we hadn't felled a tree in the wrong spot, we would have shown you that. <laughs> we ran out of time. So we'll bring the uh, next repeater site in our next site survey. 
For the Lake Cumberland Amateur Radio Association, I'm KY4BDP. Hope you enjoyed the video and look forward to our future videos on the remote HF station. And don't forget, click thumbs up and subscribe. 73.